Hey everybody, welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crip review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostess, and today's episode is season six, episode six, The Bribe. As always, John Kassir does the voice of the Crip Keeper and Danny Elfman does the theme song. This episode aired November 23rd, 1994. This episode, season six, episode six, The Bribe, was directed by Ramon Menendez, who also directed the movie Stand and Deliver, which I, I like that movie if you haven't seen it. It's pretty good. Uh, the screenplay is by Stephen Dodd, who is also the creator, and Scott Nimifro, who did the teleplay. It stars Terry O'Quinn from TV's Lost, Kimberly Williams Paisley from movies like Father of the Bride, Benicio Del Toro from movies like Traffic and Sicario, Hal Williams from TV's 227, Max Grodenchik from TV's Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and Asai Morales from TV's NYPD Blue. I'm going to go ahead here and read the description on the back of the box for The Bribe. Play with fire and a fire marshal aims to shut down a strip club where his daughter is a dancer. I'm going to be honest about this episode, The Bribe. I think it's pretty weak. It's a weak episode in the Tales from the Crypt series. It didn't really do anything like to give anything. It's just, I'll get into it, but it's just, it seemed like a pointless episode. So... If you like it, fine. I'm sure you have reasons. But for the, me, I was like, why was this even made? Like, <laughs> I don't know. It didn't feel like it established the relationships before everything went to hell. Like, it was just like, here's some people. This is what they're supposed to be. And here's the twist. Like, that's pretty much it. I mean, I understand these episodes are like 22 to 24 minutes long or whatever. But it's still, like, they could have added a little bit more. So let's go ahead and get into Season 6, Episode 6, The Bribe from Tales from the Crypt. So this episode opens up with a political crypt keeper, like it's politician, he's doing like the Uncle Sam type thing. He's got a little bit of an accent, kind of like Nixon. I wanna say it's Nixon Reagan. No, it's probably Nixon. He's doing the peace signs. Got like the Uncle Sam type outfit and there's a flag in the background, American flag. And I've seen this one done as like a, a, a meme or a gif or whatever. So yeah, this one's pretty familiar. And it's him just bringing in the episode, having a good time. This episode is definitely uh, more adult. In fact, these next three episodes are a bit more adult. Like, I don't know if they were, like, some of them in season six. For me, season six is kind of like the sensual season or like the one where they're trying to be a bit more, I don't know if they were making like a last play for like, hey, it's on HBO. Let's throw some things in here. We had only Skin Deep, season six, episode two. That one was a bit more adult and risque and things like that and now at episode six the bribe it definitely is the next one is the pit that one has some stuff in it and the next one after that is the assassin which also has a couple parts in it that were like are they doing what i think they're doing okay like you know kind of thing yeah so we get a little little spicy in these next couple episodes so here we go the bribe opens up at a strip club uh, there's a woman dressed in a devil costume. And at first, when I started watching this, I thought maybe we were going to find out the owner was the devil. And there was like a whole thing with that, which I think would have been kind of fun, but they didn't go that way. Uh, and she's, you know, she's dancing around and there's guys watching her and she's in, it's like a, oh, like a, like a vinyl cape and like a little tail. Yeah, there's lots of, um, lots of TNA in this one. You know, it's at a strip club, so you're definitely gonna, you're gonna see some, some, uh, some tops and bottoms on this. So this guy walks in, played by Terry O'Quinn. He is Inspector Martin Zeller, and he doesn't really look at the women or anything. He's got, he's in a business, like a business suit, but without the jacket. It's kind of like the guys from Cabin in the Woods, uh, the two guys downstairs kind of watching everything and stuff like that. It's like that. So he looks like that. And that's because he is a violations inspector, and he is here to lay down the law. And so now the devil lady <laughs> is stripping and she's like throwing things at him and he's ignoring it. And some guy shows up and he's like, hey, what are you doing here? Fire marshal, violations inspector, excuse me. Well, that's good, that's cool. I know who you are. Your daughter Hiley was a good friend of mine, you know? She was too good for this place. You know, and I tell you something, I try to warn her about Puck, but sometimes girls just love bad boys. You Please. Know? Zeller, what do we owe the pleasure? Oh, it's your daughter. 
in her birthday suit. Oh, yeah. Been there. Done that. You think it's pretty cute sending me this trash, don't you? Well, I got a little surprise for you, Puck. Nick Ciola, retired. I'm a new fire marshal. He goes in and he throws down some pictures in front of, I believe this is Isai Morales. Isai, I might be pronouncing that wrong. But he plays, um, he plays Puck. Puck runs this place. And basically what happened is Martin, the inspector, got these pictures and they were lewd photos of his daughter in various poses or dancing and things like that. And he's figuring out that, like, someone sent it to him. He's not sure who. But, you know, his daughter is apparently spending a lot of time here at this club, and he does not like this. And now that he is the new violations inspector for this area, he wants to either shut them down or make them pay a lot of fines or something like that to kind of, he's like, this needs to stop. Someone sent me pics of my daughter. What are you doing to her? So you find out the old inspector, played by Hal Williams, Nick, has stopped doing the job. And they used to pay him, the strip club would pay him to kind of keep quiet about whatever dealings and things they were doing there. But this new guy, Martin, especially because his daughter is dancing there or whatever she's doing with these guys, he wants to try to stop them. And of course, they're going to try to offer him a bribe. He's also like the fire marshal, you know, so you want to make sure like the place isn't too crowded. And like (laughs) this whole time in the background, there's just women dancing in shadows and things like that. And uh, Benicio Del Toro is also there. He's Puck's um, right-hand man kind of thing. Uh, his name is Bill. And so they get in a fight and everything. They're all like, oh, it's a stupid, stupid, you know. And this is where I kind of thought, like, maybe Isai Morales was supposed to be the devil and he, or Benicio Del Toro and they were going to make a deal. And, like, I don't know. <laughs> but it didn't go that way. So now it gets back to Martin Zeller's home, the inspector. And you hear some people in his apartment arguing. It's not great. The acting in this episode is a bit wooden. So when he opens the door to his apartment, there's a young woman, Kimberly Williams Paisley, and another guy playing uh, her boyfriend, and they're yelling at each other. But the way it looks, the way it's set, it looks like a stage production. Not saying stage productions are bad. I've been in some. But what I'm saying is it looks like it shouldn't belong in this apartment. (laughs) There's a coffee table and then like these two chairs, like a recliner type back chairs, but they don't recline. And a guy in a high school uh, letterman's jacket and then her in a dress. And they're just like arguing and pointing and like, I'm so done with you. I'm so done with you. And it's like he walks into this perfect scene. Like it just felt real fake. Ron, I said no. One minute you say you love me. The next minute you don't want me to touch you. I can't figure out if you're crazy or confused. What do you want? In a simple sentence, what do you want? What do I want? Yeah, just tell me. I can take it. I'm a big boy. I want you to get out. You know, you're full of problems. I'm full of problems. Yeah, you are full of problems. Just get out. (sighs) When you figure out exactly what it is that you want, you get back to me, Fine, Ron. Fine. And so you find out that um, his daughter, Hilly, I think it is, her name is Hilly or Haley. They're breaking up and her dad's like, oh no, that what happened? <laughs> She's like, dad, shut up. You don't know. And so, so Haley is like, we broke up. And then Martin's like, oh, but he seemed like such a nice kid. And like, the thing is you start learning that, I mean, they rushed this father daughter relationship, which I understand they have to, but it's like, you, under, you kind of get the feeling that like, he really tries to protect her. She's kind of fallen back from her so-called bad ways, according to him, like, or she implied she was being taken advantage of, I guess. Her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, has a lot of money and, like, found out. I guess his parents, like, found out about what she did or how she was or something. Maybe his parents could come up with the money. (sighs) Dad, we're not getting married, okay? We're not even going out anymore. We broke up. Why, honey? What happened? (sighs) He's being a bastard. (sighs) He's afraid his parents will freak out if I'm not in college. He said they're already hinting that I'm not good enough for him. I mean, his mother called me a slut, and he didn't even defend me. He's such a wuss. So afraid they'll cut him off from his precious trust fund. And so it's just like a whole thing, like all about money and appearance and things like that. And so she broke it off with him. For Martin, her father, it was more like, oh, we don't have a whole lot of money. This guy does. He seems like a nice, clean-cut guy, conservative type guy. Just please go with him. (laughs) Like, please, trying to find the right path for his daughter. And she's like 18, if that. I think, I mean, because the other guy's in high school. I think her boyfriend's in high school. I think she's supposed to be 17, 18. So I'm like, she's really getting involved in a lot of things at a young age. So I could see why the dad would be a bit scared, especially if he got pictures and stuff. But like, it's like, okay, but unless she's supposed to be a little older, but I don't think so. (laughs) So Martin, the dad, he's like, oh, that's a bummer. You know, he kind of goes in and talks to her. And she assures him, like, I'm not into that stuff anymore with Puck and all of them. And that's not even how this is. And this is why we broke up, me and the other guy. 
And you get, I mean, I guess you could see where her dad would be kind of stifling. I mean, really, he's just a dad who's just trying to make decent money to send her to college and get her a good life. So later that night, Martin meets up with Nick. And Nick is the old fire marshal inspector. And he is played by Hal Williams. And he's got injuries. He's got um, a breathing tube, some sort of condition, <laughs> where he needs like a breathing oxygen tank and things like that. He's got, I think, some burn marks. I think even you find out Martin's got some stuff. Nick, the old fire marshal, is like, I know all about you, Nick. Yeah, I know you do. Puck called me. Well, I'm not going to try to kid you. It was never hard. 2500 a month is a lot of money for a guy earning a civil service yeah. wage. Dirty money? Sure it is, but you think about it. Think what you could do for Hyland. But it's not right. Don't Nick. tell me about what's right. I bust my balls for 20 years. And for what? The Solomon Building, 1974. Collapsed stairway breaks both my arms. Second degree burns over 30% of my body. Dirt chemical. The L.A. riots. My lungs get permanently seared by the toxic fumes because nobody warned us. Nobody knew shit. And for that, I end up wearing this thing for the rest of my life. Now, you tell me what that's worth. Tell me what I should have charged for the pain. Company, like what we work for in this town, in this city, has screwed us over. We get hurt and nothing happens or we don't get properly compensated or all this stuff. And he's like, that's why I was taking the money from Puck in the strip club, because why not? Because Martin's trying to wrap his mind about it, around it. You know, he's like, why, you know, now they're offering me money. Should I take it? And Nick's like, yeah, I think you should. <laughs> why not? Take it. You can get Hilly um, college money and things like that. And so he decides, Martin decides to take it. So he goes back to see Puck and Bill. And he's getting, I think it's $60,000 kind of as a hush money. And he's like, okay, I'll take the money, but, you know, I want those pictures, like, gone and things like that. And, like, my daughter has nothing to do with you. And then Puck is like, I don't know where those pictures came from, man. And then Martin's like, if I ever catch you near my daughter again, I'll kill you. But he still took the money. And see, even here, this is where Puck is like, you know, you just made a deal with the devil. And I was like, is there going to be a twist of the devil? Sounds like it'd be more fun or, like, more, like, kind of interesting or something, you know. But that's not what's going to happen in this episode, guys. Not in the bribe. Now we're, we left the strip club and we're back at the apartment and you, you know, you learn a little more about Martin not having a whole lot of money. Hilly's getting ready to go to the stand. She's wearing a red dress. It's a little provocative. It's, you know, but it, she's going to some party. Yeah. And she may have lost her scholarship or something with the college and she's afraid she's not going to be able to get the money. And then he's like, no, I figured it out. And she's like, how did daddy, how did you get the money? And he's like, don't worry about it and all this stuff. And she's like, okay. And she's going to like this event. And I think she's supposed to be going out with the ex. I think maybe they're making it work or something. Let's see. Yeah, because that's why he takes it. Because she was, that's why he took the hush money. Because Hilly was losing her scholarship or not being able to get into college as easily. And so he needed the money. And so while she's getting ready to go to this party, he gives her this bracelet. Like a heart charm bracelet thing that belonged to her mother. So now it establishes that her mother has passed away. He's been a single dad for a while, trying to do the best he can by his daughter and wanting the best for her. And she's like, oh, thank you. You know, he puts it on. Yeah, she's going out with that ex. And so when she leaves, he goes, don't come back without an engagement ring to his daughter. And I'm like, she is 18. She's supposed to be going to college first, right? That's the point. Like college. I mean, just because this guy has money and is on the straight and narrow doesn't mean it's going to like, don't push her so much. That's one thing I could definitely see about him being stifling with her because it's like, just let her go to the party. They just possibly got back together again. <laughs> like, don't push for an engagement ring. Martin has a plan. Even though he took the hush money, he wants to get rid of this strip club still, which is weird. I kind of find it, I guess, because he has the money he needs, so now he doesn't want to deal with them anymore. I don't know. But it all goes really quickly. So Martin drives out, I don't know where. <laughs> it looks like the boiler room of like a high school or something. There's a guy there who is a bit of an arsonist who likes, you know, he likes to play with fire. And he's using a magnifying lens to nuke ants in an ant farm. And he's been smoking or something down there. He's not supposed to be playing with any of that. And I'm assuming that Martin probably knows him because of the whole fire marshal thing. And he's supposed to be not lighting fires. And <laughs> so Martin shows up to investigate wherever he's at. Maybe it's just his house, but it looks like a warehouse. And he's like, oh, I smell smoke. And he's like, what? No. Vic, I smell smoke in here somewhere. They cured you, Vic. Look at all this junk. I thought they cured you. Ah, 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 ah. 
might be Bick. That might be who this is. Played by Max Grodenchik. And so he's like, you know, he catches him with the ant farm. He's like, you're not supposed to be playing with fire or whatever you're doing. And he's like, I have a job for you if you really want to set a fire. And he is like, okay, sure. And so he wants Bick to set a fire to the strip club. And technically, I guess he's setting up this guy if he takes the fall for him. You know, I don't know. So he dangles this opportunity in front of Bick's face. And it's too tempting. So now it cuts to there's smoke and flames coming out of this building. That's where the strip club is. The whole place has been burnt really badly. Martin's trying not to look too pleased. You know, he's standing outside like, oh, it's a damn shame this happened. And that's when like the fire chief, someone like that, comes up to him and he's like, I need you to come with me. And he's like, what? You know, he's making kind of making jokes, which is a bit inappropriate. It's like, maybe try not to look so happy. So he's like, come with me, I need you to see something. He's like, what? And so there's like all these bodies laying on the ground, covered up, up against the wall. It's kind of creepy, up against the wall of the building, because it go, it stretches for a while. So it's like they're just pulling all these bodies out onto the side of the road to keep them out of everyone's way, onto the side of the building. And I remember this scene. This is where I was like, okay, yeah, I definitely remember this part. Apparently there was like a private party going on in the strip club. And that's when you come across the smoky body of, I believe it was, is it Issei Morales? Yeah, I think it might be. And the private party that was there is the same party his daughter had attended. So Puck, he's got her bracelet. He's got the charm bracelet in his hand. Like it kind of melded there and he shows it to him. And that's when Martin's like, oh my God, my daughter was in there and she's dead. I killed her because she went here instead of the party she had told me she was going to with that other guy. What did I do? Oh my God. Been in this business for 20 some years, but this looks like a total loss to me. That's a damn shame. Couldn't happen to a nicer person. Look, Zell, I need you to come over to the ambulance with me. Well, one of our guys get hurt? No, no. Private parties, hell. It's bad out here, but it, it's, it's even worse inside. And the owner got out alive. Uh, God's hell. Nobody else made it out. Buck, listen, listen to me. Inspector Zeller's here. You tell him what you told me. Tell him who the party was for. He's at first he's like skeptical. He takes the chain. He's like, this can't be right. And he's like washing it under some water on the wall. And then he sees what it is. And he's like, oh my God, it is. And so he's completely gone. And now it shoots back to the apartment and there's like wind and flowy drapes and things like that. And then you just see the shadow of him with a gun and he kills himself in her bedroom with this pistol. So he does that. And you're like, that went really quickly. The phone rings, and then as it's ringing, you can hear this message, and it's from his daughter, and his daughter is not dead. And it pans out, and you see him and a bunch of blood, and he's laying on the floor. And basically what she's saying is she's in love, and she eloped. And she's like, I know, I was hoping to get you, like, just call me, whatever. And it cuts back to this phone booth that she's in, and she's, like, carefree, and she's got this nice, like, flowy kind of outfit, uh, blouse top on. And she's like, I know you're going to be upset, but I eloped. Hello, can't get to the phone right now, so please leave a message and we'll return your call as soon as we can. Thanks. Hi, Dad, it's Hiley. You there? Pick up. Pick up, pick up. I didn't have to say this to a machine. Dad, I eloped. I know you're probably really angry with me right now. You have every right to be. But, Dad, I'm happy. I'm in love, and we're not going to have to worry about money anymore. Oh, look, someday, someday I will explain to you why we did this. Every detail, I promise. But, but for now, I just want you to know that I never meant to hurt you, Dad. Okay, well, I'll call again. Um, I just hope when I do, you want to talk to me. I love you. Don't move. You think people are going to be mad at us if we left the party early? And it's kind of a dangerous phone booth. There's all this jagged glass and broken. It's like kind of out in the outskirts of town. And I'm like, all right, it's a good way to get tetanus or something. And then there's a guy taking pictures and it's Benicio Del Toro's character. So she ends up running off and even though she was kind of like, seems like she was more into Puck, it turns out she was actually into Bill. 
So she ends up eloping with Bill, Benicio Del Toro's character, and they're all packed and ready to go. They're in like this convertible top down car and they're being all cute and flirty or whatever. And it's like, okay. But she also made the implication now, like when she's talking to Bill, that she didn't care about that bracelet. She was like, yeah, it was a, you know, whatever. And I'm like, that was your mother's. But she's like 18. And she basically is just like, I don't care about my mom who was dead. I don't care about my dad who's trying to help me. I'm running off with this guy and I'm 18 and like all this stuff. And I'm just like, all right. And now she doesn't know that her dad killed himself. It was a twist, but like it all happens so quickly, just one after the other, all squeezed into this episode where it didn't feel like that everyone got a chance to kind of settle in their characters. If it would have been extended in the time for this episode, like closer to like 30, 35 minutes and they had a little more time, I think it could have been done a little better. But uh, yeah, so I guess the morality is like, for me, I think it'd be take a breather before you make decisions. Because if he would have just relaxed a little bit, sat on that money, not lit that place on fire, then he wouldn't have been so concerned about his daughter. Then he could have waited and maybe not killed himself. Then about five minutes later, he would have got the phone call from his daughter seeing she was alive. It was almost like a uh, the situation from if you've ever seen The Mist, the ending there. Like if you just wait five more minutes. I like that movie, The Mist. But I remember watching it in, in, uh, in college, just about threw my remote into the screen at the end. That's the end of season six, episode six, The Bribe. Cuts back to the Crypt Keeper. He is still a politician. And he is just throwing out those puns just over and over. He's free to do so in front of that American flag. <laughs> Crypt Keeper, you're so punny. And the best Crypt Keeper pun is... Poor Zella tries to give his kid a shot and it winds up going to his head. Which is better than if it went to his pocketbook. Because government needs to do more and ghost less. We have to make horrid choices and back them up with spending cuts. But yeah, that's the end. There's no IMDb trivia for this episode. So that was season six, episode six, The Bribe. The next episode is season six, episode seven, The Pit. Thank you all so much for downloading and listening to this episode. If you want to leave a review, please do so. I will read it on the podcast. You can leave it on Facebook, on Apple Podcasts. You can follow me on Facebook. You can also follow me on Twitter. That's at GEC Podcast or at G-E-K Podcast. Uh, you can also follow Gus, the podcat, on his Instagram page, a sweet cat named Gus. And yeah, thank you all so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and have a good one. Bye. I just had quite a scare.